Today we have the wonderful Charlie Teo in our studio. Charlie is an internationally renowned neurosurgeon who has written three books in his field and has been published in over 120 peer-reviewed journals. Charlie is often considered a maverick in his field and often has been the focus of divisive opinions on his practices. However, he is most known for his willingness to give hope to many when there seems to be none. I'm so happy to have him on the show to share some of his experience in tenacity and perseverance. Please welcome Charlie Teo. Yeah, so, so thanks for uh, coming on board and uh, joining us today, uh, uh, Charlie. I've been a really big fan of yours for uh, for a long time. And of course, um, you've had a, a, a an impact on my life through a friend of mine, uh, Andrea, who um, had a had a brain tumor and um, no one would operate on him except uh -huh. for you and uh, Aldo and Mina, the parents. Um who were really responsible for my uh, the beginning of my career. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Aldo obviously in, uh, has been in coffee for a long, long time. And, um, you, know, you know, watching watching them spend, you know, those few precious more months and, you know, close to a year now um, with Andrea was, you know, really priceless. So, um, and ever since then I've, you know, kind of uh, more or less followed, followed you. Oh, good. And so... Uh, You're really, a stalker. Yeah, total stalker. <laughs> <laughs> no, and so uh, it's really, really amazing to have you on here. Um, I wanted to ask you, actually, do you still, uh, before we start, do you still uh, have that Honda uh, 900 no, RR? I've got a, uh, a bigger, faster bike. Oh, now. what yeah, are you yeah. riding now? So I've got an Aprilia RSV4. Ah. It's one of the limited edition sort of racing bikes. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we all ride uh, right here off... Um, I've uh, ordered myself the uh, new V4 Street Fighter from Ducati. Oh, just just make sure you take it for a test drive because um, I took the Panigale, the sports yeah. the sports version. Yeah, 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 yeah. For a weekend, and it burnt. It actually burnt. I got burns. Yeah, burns it has, runs super hot, and yeah, if you're really close. Yeah, I had a monster, and that happened to me too. Yeah, so just so they said that? it's improved, and with the. The wings, it's uh, increased the airflow and reduced the heat, but I I'd take it for a weekend if I were you. Yeah, totally, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Well, definitely too. Because remember, the first V4, V4 was the Aprilia. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> yeah, it was too. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So how long have you had that? I've had that probably two years now. Oh, nice. Still going fast? Well, you know, it's a ridiculously fast <laughs> bike. You've got to take it on the... Eastern Creek to really open yeah. up and take get its full potential. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's really uh, such a such a joy riding. It just it just you can't concentrate on anything else other than the road. Exactly. Otherwise, you you know you die. You die. <laughs> <laughs> or seriously injure yourself. Yeah. No. So thank you for um, yeah you know for kind of on and I just you know uh, you've you've obviously touched so many people's lives uh, throughout your career. And in, you know, great ways and in life-changing ways and, of course, um, have uh, given hope to so many people, right? Um, but in many ways, people label you um, a maverick in, in your field. Um, is that what you've always wanted to do when you were young, to be a neurosurgeon? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> So the first part of the question is absolutely not. And the second part of the question is, did I ever want to be a maverick? And absolutely not as well. Sure. So not that I am a wilting flower and not that I uh, am meek and mild. I'm not that at all. But I certainly uh, never yearned the limelight. And I certainly never uh, aspired to being a maverick or being a world-class neurosurgeon. I It was... Pure serendipity that got me in the field. I actually never liked neurosurgery as a medical student. Yeah. And then when I was thrust into neurosurgery, I found it very appealing and very challenging. And I guess that's why I stayed in it. And that's why I still love it today because it's so challenging. Because but, your father was a doctor. Yeah, my right? father was a doctor. Uh, he was first a GP and then an obstetrician gynecologist. And by all accounts, quite talented at his job. I never really knew him that well, so I don't mm -hmm. know firsthand, but apparently he's quite talented. And uh, so, you know, I guess he sowed the seed of doing medicine, but no, the seed of neurosurgery came pure, pure, purely, purely serendipitously. Yeah, yeah right. So, you know, um, 
your, mo- your mother obviously immigrated to uh, Australia with your father from Singapore. Singapore, yeah. Uh, were you born here? I was born here yeah. uh, in 1957. Uh, but they had immigrated from Singapore 19, early 1950s. Mm. And I read, uh, I read somewhere that you actually wanted to become a mechanic at one stage. Yes. Yeah, I took up a mechanic apprenticeship thinking that, you know, I knew that I was good with my hands and I liked fixing things, uh, but I didn't like the disrespect I was given by the public sure. and the lack of any sort of respect actually. Uh, it was mm. quite demeaning and... And I thought, well, listen, I can still do things with my hands and get maybe get a bit more respect from from the public by being a doctor. Right, and right. So, yeah. Did, did, you know, your father's um, profession when you were younger, did that have anything to influence you in that sense? Well, subconsciously it may have, but no, consciously I never... Uh, again, he wasn't a very nice man. I didn't have a good relationship with him, so it's never as if I wanted to be like him or mm. had this dream of being a doctor like him. Right. Uh, but but I guess subconsciously maybe, you know, they they sowed the seed, i.e. my mum and my dad sowed the seed. Mm. Um, you know, I, again, I um, I learned that, you know, you, you're my, because my father left um, my mother when I was extremely young, I think right. uh, in the months. Um, so... I, um, I never really, um, up until sort of 10 years old, I really had my grandfather as a, as kind of a role model. Um, how hard was it for you when you were growing up um, not having sort of that um, male influence there uh, for you? It was very difficult. Mm. I mean, even today I cite it as part of the reason I have flaws in my personality. Uh, I think you need a father figure or a father. Yeah. And I looked for father figures on the TV or at boarding school from senior boys, but no, nothing nothing replaces the influence, mm. the positive influence of having a father. Yeah, yep. And or even a grandfather. And I never had a grandfather. Course. Yeah, sure. So um, you, your your parents obviously um, didn't approve of you being a mechanic, being Asian parents. Uh, I can't <laughs> ever remember them being. Dra- you know, dragon... Dragon mothers? Mothers or... Sorry, tiger. Uh, tiger mothers. Tiger mothers yeah, yeah, yeah. or fathers. <laughs> uh, I can't remember them really pushing hard, but, I mean, I can remember them when I'd say things like I'd like to be this or that, they'd go, mm, try and talk me out of it. I wanted to be a, the prime minister or a politician <laughs> or a lawyer. Yeah. And they... they str- str- not, not strongly but very subtly discouraged me from doing those things. Mm. Yeah, so... You know, when you, um, you know, when, when you were kind of working as a mechanic, um, you said that you were disres- uh, you felt disrespectful, or other people uh, treated you, you know, with with disrespect. Yes. Um, obviously, that was the catalyst for you to do something that people looked up to, right? Right. Um, did you, when you when you were doing medicine at that time, and when that when that happened? Um, growing up in the 70s and 80s, I, uh, I would imagine through that period, did you, you know, experience um, racism as a, you know, as a teenager, as a, yeah, so the, a the, young man? Those formative years were the 60s uh, and early 70s and ha- hand on heart, with all honesty, I can't ever remember uh, going into the public arena and not being... Uh, jeered at, mocked, uh, teased for being Chinese. Mm. It, it was every 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 occasion. Yeah, right. Every time you went to a shopping centre, every time you went to a restaurant, every time you went to a sporting event, any a concert, uh, a pub, there wasn't one time that I can't remember someone looking sideways or saying nasty things or treating you differently uh, because you're Chinese. Yeah, wow. It was bad. It was bad. And, you know, people who say there wasn't racism then or now, it's all well and good to say that if you're not Chinese to say that there's no racism against Chinese or that you're, if you're not Middle Eastern to say there's no racism against Muslims and Middle Eastern. And unless, unless you're one of them, you don't really know because sometimes it can be very, quite a covert and quite oh, subtle. Absolutely. Now, other times, sure, it's quite overt and, and pretty nasty, but other times it can be quite subtle and... It's only if you are the brunt of it that you actually pick up on it. Yeah. 
So how did that make you feel? I mean, you know, you. Um, I think I read somewhere that your sister used to stand up for you and <laughs> tell <laughs> she them did. to. She, she was like this yappy little chihuahua who used to sort of, you know, they'd back off because she was so uh, so aggressive. Yeah. I, I guess, you know, again, it, look, I don't know if it's influenced what I've become or what I did, but it's it's... You can either uh, let it affect you negatively. In other words, you can uh, melt away and become nothing and try and fly under the radar and merge in with the with the environment so that you don't stand out. Or yeah. you can let it uh, let it uh, build your strength and make you a better and stronger person. And I guess if it's as black and white as that, I took definitely the latter path. Mm. And so I, you know, learned karate. And I wanted to beat the hell out of all these people, and I just, yeah. you know, sort of like, you cannot treat me like that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a real person here. I, I deserve more respect than that. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna make sure you respect me, even if it means I have to beat beat the crap out of you. Or, or, you know. Yeah. So I, I yeah. went. I, I guess I might have gone too far the other way because I became quite angry. Sure. You know, I was a bouncer in a nightclub, and and I was a good fighter, and uh, and so I used to beat people up. Uh, just because they would tease me for being Chinese, and yeah. I didn't have to do that. I could have easily just stood back yeah. and been more of a man, actually. Sure. And uh, but you know, I sort of I was angry. I was testosterone driven. Mm. I was a black belt, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go to town, <laughs> go <laughs> destroy to town, these yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's funny when you say that because I I remember growing up. Um, obviously, I'm a little bit younger than you, but I, I remember growing up even in the '90s. Um, uh, going to primary school uh, was, you know, there were far more Asians um, and Asian kids back then, but still, you know, you got teased and you got um, made fun of just because, you know, you were Chinese. Yeah. Or, and it's not a nice feeling. And, and I think uh, I, I kind of went the other way. I really retreated in my shell. Right. And it took a long time for me to... I guess work out my identity uh, yeah. of if I was Chinese or Australian or I was both. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it was. Um, yeah, it definitely would have been a, a, a difficult time for you, but in a obviously a different way. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Look, I, I can relate to that. I can relate to wanting to just you know melt away, sure. and in, in some ways that's not a weak thing to do. Mm. It's a defense mechanism. Absolutely. And uh, you know if that's if that's what get you through it then fine yeah but yeah yeah you just we're all different and uh, my approach was uh, the opposite my approach was on the front foot <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and that that maybe is what you know set um perhaps those were the formative years that set you up for you know dealing with um your other confrontations later on in life with your medical <laughs> medical career oh i look i really think so but but was it because of that in other words was it nurturing it got me there or was it nature? In other words, just did I have it in my genes that I was a pugilist mm. and that I was, uh, you know, not going to take that or did it develop with time? Look, I, I don't know and I'll sure. never know. But yeah. I somehow think it was all genetic, you know, that it was just in the genes that mm. uh, yeah, that's what you do. <laughs> Absolutely. So you um, you finished your studies in um, in Sydney and you met your, you met your wife um, in Sydney um, early nineties uh, or late uh, late nineties, right? Uh, uh, late eighties. Eight. Sorry, was it? Late, yeah, late eighties. Uh, late 80s, yeah. And then you had um, your first daughter uh, around two thousand and one. No, 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 no. Uh, Ninety two. Ninety two. Oh, yeah. I must have gotten my uh, yes yeah. mixed up. Um, how was that when you were still practicing and? Um, and you know, it uh, was exactly what people tell couples when they're thinking of having children or not thinking of having children. There's sure. never a right time to have children. Yeah, you can yeah. always find an excuse to, to not have kids. And, uh, you know, it's not the right time. I don't have enough money. haven't moved in. I'm going somewhere next year. You know, all those excuses mm. not to have children. So uh, once I heard someone say that, it's never a good time to have children. I thought, oh, well, bugger it. You might, I might as well have it now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and in... Yeah, I mean, on paper it wasn't a good time. I was overseas. My future was really uh, in question. I didn't know where I was going to end up, back in Australia or in America. Financially I was very mm. uh, not well off and so, but, yeah. But 
you, you cope. Yeah, yeah. How, how, you know, how did you, um, was, it, was it hard for you to, uh, because you would, you'd be spending quite a lot of time in the, um, you know, in the, uh, in the hospital and treating your patients. So what was the work-life balance there for you? You know, it's, it's one of those things where I've always had an internal uh, conflict about the time you need to spend at work to make a difference mm. and to excel at your job versus time uh, required to make a family work. And, uh, and, and it has been. It's a conflict not only for me. It's, I mean, I think everyone goes through the same internal conflict uh, and it was resolved by the Dalai Lama, actually. No way. Yeah, yeah. So I actually I had lunch with the Dalai Lama. We spent about four hours together, one on one. Wow. And uh, yeah, I brought that up. I said, "Listen, I've got this internal conflict that I've had for years. Mm. Can you help me resolve it?" Yeah, yeah. And uh, I go, "Look, I love my work. I spend hours and hours at work because I just love it so much. Uh, but I love my family as well, and I spend hours with them, but you know, not as much as work and." And uh, I have this conflict. What's, what should I do? And he said very simply, he goes, oh, well, the answer is very, very easy. What, what do all humans want when they're born and want for the rest of their lives? And I thought it was some philosophical question. So I thought, <laughs> oh, gee, I better answer this correctly. I go, to make a difference or to make the world a better place? And he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, it's happiness. And uh, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. And he goes, are you happy at work? I go, yes. Are you happy at home? Yes. He goes, where's the conflict? <laughs> like it's, uh, he said, if you spent less time at work and weren't happy, then, of course, you're going to spend more time at home unhappy and that's not going to be good quality time and family aren't going to appreciate that and you're going to resent it. And yeah. So if the bottom line is happiness and you've achieved happiness in both those aspects of your life, then I don't think there's a conflict. That's such an amazing way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. And so... You know, speak to my wife when, uh, well, my ex-wife when <laughs> yeah, you sure. uh, when we discuss this, and she'll probably say, you know, I wish she'd given you a different advice, because you know, she she I'm sure would have wanted me, and our marriage probably would have survived if I'd spent more time at home. Mm. Uh, but uh, but I was really happy with my family at that time, and I was really happy with my work, and so yeah, I just continued working hard at work and being happy. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's um, you know the difficulty for a lot of people, right? Um, some people hate their jobs, want to come home. Some people love their jobs, don't want to come home, and yep. that's a oh my god, it's, a, it's a, yeah, it'll be a conflict f until the end of time. Mm. Yeah. No, absolutely. The, the the key is to uh, find an area that you love, and also uh, find a you know amount of time that you can spend with your kids and have that balance. Yeah, yeah. Um, then so. You know, weren't you satisfied just being the neurosurgeon and towing the line and uh, have your wonderful family and kids? What made you become a maverick? Like what, what made you <laughs> kind of like go step out of the normal me medical fraternity and start going, no, I'm not going to do it okay, that way. Okay, so here's the short answer. Yeah. And a lot of your listeners and you probably won't believe me, but I promise you, I absolutely promise you I never tried to be a maverick. I never tried to step out of the line, swim against the tide, yeah. go against consensus. I never tried. I always thought that what I was doing was what all doctors should be doing. Sure. And so it turns out that, you know, I, not all doctors have the same approach as me, but, but I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, so, again, it was just purely genetic driven. I mean, I just thought that all doctors should do the best they can for their patients I thought that all doctors should keep an open mind to new things, try and push the envelope, uh, try and think outside the box, mm. uh, do all those things that would hopefully end up giving your patients the best result. And uh, so all those other things that I've since found out should have influenced me if I wanted to be considered mainstream, like, you know, towing the party line, <laughs> giving the same opinion as someone else so yeah, you don't yeah, yeah. Uh, piss them off, uh, uh, going to MDTs, multidisciplinary team mm. meetings and and playing the game and doing what the majority of people want you to do. You know, all those things that other doctors are very comfortable doing uh, and they have very comfortable careers uh, never gelled with me. I just never thought that 
you should do that. I always mm. thought that you should put your patient's best interest first. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you, I guess I'm here doing this podcast because you pay a terrible price for it, but I never, I never thought I'd be paying a price for it. I never thought that I'd stand out in a crowd because I did it. I just thought I'd be the, just like everyone else. Mm. Yeah. Where, where, did the, where did, like, what was the first moment that, you know, you kind of, do you remember there, if there was a first moment that you go, oh, I'm getting criticised for something that I'm doing? Yeah, there were two aha moments. One aha moment was I tried a new technique, a minimally invasive technique that I thought about and I learnt from a neurosurgeon in Germany mm-hmm. on a patient and the outcome was fantastic. Sure. Minimally invasive approach to a... Uh, a craniopharyngioma through an eyebrow approach, got all the tumour out, patient did well, no scar, scar hidden in the eyebrow. So I thought I would show everyone this at a M&M meeting, a morbidity mortality meeting at, uh, at the department that I was working at at the time. And I showed it and I got nothing but criticism from the chairman saying what? that, yeah, yeah, it was like, don't you ever do that again. He wouldn't let me do it again. It was just too left field. It was too out there, too... To what he thought too dangerous to do, uh, and it and I guess I never verbalised what was going on at the time, but I certainly thought to myself, oh, geez, that, that's a bit funny. But he's my chairman; I better listen to what he has to say. The second aha moment was something that's a little bit distasteful, mm. and uh, but it was like this: a neurosurgeon was drinking alcohol. Uh, he was called in to see a young boy with an extradural hematoma a blood clot, uh, but he, because he was drunk or because he had alcohol in his breath, he told the emergency room doctor to, to transfer the patient to us at, at the major teaching hospital I was working at the time. Mm. And uh, the emergency doctor says to him, I think you better come in and see this patient. You know, he's got uh, a pupil that's a bit sluggish now. I don't think he'll be able to make it to so-and-so hospital. Uh, he goes, no, 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 I don't need to see him. Don't worry about that. Uh, he doesn't need surgery urgently, just get him over to so-and-so. By the time he got to us at so-and-so, uh, he was dead. Uh. And uh, so he died purely as a result of this guy's irresponsibility. So I said at the m M&M meeting when I was presented, I said, just make sure you call that neurosurgeon and tell him that because of him this, pa- this young 28-year-old man is dead. I want him to know that. I want him to feel the pain. And the chairman stands up and goes, don't you dare. He goes, you call up that doctor and you say, thank you very much for referring the patient to us. Unfortunately, he didn't make it, but we appreciate the referral. And I go, what? He goes, listen, if you piss that doctor off, you'll never get another referral from him ever again and therefore you'll never be able to treat a whole lot more patients uh, than if you piss him off and you criticise him and you berate him and you get upset with him. If you get upset with him... All it's going to do is stop him from referring patients. So in the long run, you'll be able to save less patients or be able to treat less patients than if you were nice to him. And when you sit back and think about it, he's right. He's absolutely right. But mm. it's just so wrong that this absolutely. guy never paid a price or never never got reprimanded for killing a young man. And uh, so then I realised that politics, uh, playing the game... Being politically correct, listening to people's advice who are nowhere near as experienced or as knowledgeable as you, but politically they're more important than you, all those things play a role in decision-making in medicine. And uh, I chose at that stage never to let that happen. I just don't think I could have slept with myself. I couldn't Mm. have woken up in the morning and be proud of myself. Sure. So... From that moment on, I've made a conscious decision to do what I believe is the best thing for the patient, even though it may not be the best thing for me. Mm. Politically, financially, uh, you know, popularity-wise, it's not going to be good for me, but it's going to be good for my patients. Uh, And, uh, yeah, that's how I treat all my patients and that's why I think I've developed the reputation that I've got because I I love my patients and I, I treat them with respect and I listen to what they have to say and I, uh, I'm very honest with them and, mm. and that's been my reputation and that's what's really kept me going despite all the uh, antagonism and all the uh, 
uh, political power against me. Mm-hmm. You must have felt um, a bit, you know, a bit uh, helpless um, when the chairman said that um, said that to you, and you must have been super angry. You know, um, going back on earlier conversation, especially when you know someone like that was telling you. Um, you know, to do something that was totally uh, against what you believe. Yeah, morally what I thought was wrong. Yeah. Look, uh, no, uh, I wasn't angry and I wasn't, uh, I don't know, that I guess the only word that really comes to mind is uh, perplexed, mm. shocked, because just remember you treat other people the way you think you would react and you would want to be treated. So you're always projecting your moral code onto other people. Yeah. So when they show that their moral code is diametrically opposite to yours, it comes as a real shock because you go, hang on, you shouldn't be thinking that or you shouldn't be saying that. You know, what's driving you? Uh, And as you mature, of course, you realise that we're all different and we all have different moral codes and different compasses by which we, you know, live live our lives. But, uh, no, it's not anger so much as just, what? Are you kidding? Mm. Like, yeah. uh, Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, that was the first instance, right, <laughs> that you uh, that you experienced. Yes. And so, later on in your career, when you've um, sort of gone against the the grain, oh, gone against the grain, as um, so to speak, you had, um, you know, hospitals restrict your privileges. Yes. You had, um, you know, uh, people telling you don't offer a second opinion. That's contrary to the first. Yes. Um, tell me a little bit more about that and how, you know, that really hampered uh, what you were trying to do. Oh, look, Jack, it's... Uh, I, I'm not quite sure how much I can say because I'm currently <laughs> embroiled in a fight now. I mean, I guess I can say because I'm embroiled in fights all the time. But... Uh, without naming names or anything. Yeah, without naming you know. names. It, it So... Uh, virtually every couple of weeks uh, someone or some medical governing body, uh, and that someone is almost always a doctor, yeah. has tried to derail my career, uh, besmirch my character, uh, destroy my reputation, uh, uh, deregister me, uh, and it's happening right now as we speak. Yeah. Uh, but it's no surprise because it's been happening for decades, mm. uh, and you know the fact that you know about it means that I haven't been backward in coming forward about it. Sure. I mean, it's so unfair to me uh, that it's happening uh, that I just can't I can't keep my mouth shut. Mm. And my lawyers have said, you know, keep your mouth shut, fly below the radar, yeah. don't mention anything. But you know, it's just so so unfair that mm. uh, I just can't I can't hold back. It's my personality. I just yeah. I just uh, it's. You know, the world needs to know that it's just a very unfair place. And, again, I think that's the gist of why you're interviewing me because, you know, I think you want people to know that it hasn't been a smooth road Mm. and that there have been these hurdles all the way along it. Uh, And I guess my comment about that is that uh, in life there's always going to be hurdles and you either jump them and use them as uh, stepping blocks to to gain greater heights or you let them stop you yeah. and uh, you start, you know, you start sort of backing off yeah. and yeah. running a different race. Uh, uh, it, 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 oh, God, I don't want to be negative but it does take its toll. Yeah, I, I, I didn't imagine. And, and the, the toll is such where you start then being very philosophical about it, you know. Uh, you've got to start... St- seeing this as not what people are doing to you but what people are doing for you. Mm. And so, yes, they will win. I mean, I know it. I've said it in previous interviews. I'll say it now. Uh, My colleagues will win and they will stop me from practising medicine uh, and certainly practising neurosurgery. But uh, I don't want to see it as them winning. I want to see it as them helping me move to the next, you know, stage of my life. Sure. Uh, uh, And... And by doing that, I ho- hopefully it won't destroy me, Mm-mm. the person, and I'll be stronger f- stronger for it. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I mean, that's that's super, super difficult and tough, especially in an industry where I, I wouldn't imagine there's thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of neurosurgeons. It would be a quite <laughs> small field. How does it, you know, like uh, your colleagues' criticism of you or the board or whoever you may be, you know, all that shit talking they, they say to you, does it get to you personally? Uh, of course it does. And, again, when you do a superficial interview, just so you don't have to dwell on it, you say, oh, no, 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 it's like water off duck's back. Mm. But, no, of course it gets to you because, you know, they're trying to undermine your very nature, your very the very essence of you. They're trying to say that, you know, at the moment they're trying to say some surgeries that I've done uh, should be considered futile and the fact that I tried them and got bad results means that I shouldn't be allowed to practice which is ridiculous. I mean, it sounds ridiculous and it is ridiculous because if we don't try new things and if we don't try and be more aggressive with cancer and if we don't try and uh, beat this disease, how are we going to ever make it any advances? Mm. And by trying new things, of course, some people are, you know, not going to do well. Absolutely. And, of course, there are going to be some bad results, but such is the nature of making advances in Mm. medicine. I think the most important thing is just to be honest with your patients and say, listen... You know you're going to die. I know you're going to die. By all accounts, everyone's telling you you're going to die, but there's this operation that I think I might be able to do that might be able to help you. It may not, yeah. but I'm hoping it will. And, uh, and uh, as, you know, if they say I want it yeah. and they they know the circumstances and the, the risks involved, then I think you should give them the respect that they deserve and that is patient autonomy and, and listen to what they have to say. Do the operation. If it doesn't go well, most people, if it doesn't go well, go, thank you, Charlie, for trying. We mm. knew the the risks the yeah. risks, and it didn't work, but we're happy that we tried it. Uh, you know, some people are very unhappy, but uh, but most people are still very happy that you've done it. Yeah, it's not like you're going out there to absolutely do your worst. You know, people, people for some reason think that, oh, just because this patient uh, passed away because of your surgery technique or what, what you've done... Um, it's, it's not like you went in there to purposely do that. The, the intention's always... No, but here's the problem. Remember what I said? You judge other people by the way you think. Sure. So these doctors do things for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. They're egomaniacs. They're trying to build up their own uh, uh, towers. Uh, they're trying to make money. Mm. Uh, they're trying to prove something to themselves. They're ego-driven. Uh, they're arrogant. Then, of course, they're going to judge you by the way they do it. So, yeah. you know, when Charlie Teo gets a bad result, ah, oh, Charlie Teo is doing it for the money because yeah. that's the way they think, you know, mm. or Charlie Do- Teo is doing it to try and prove something because that's the way they think mm-hmm. or Charlie Teo is doing it because he just wants the attention or, you know, yeah. he wants the glory. Well, that's, you know, that's the way they think. So you can't blame them for thinking that you did it for all the wrong reasons yeah, if absolutely. that's what they would have done it for. So... Mm-hmm. So when I'm accused by all these people for doing things for money or doing things for that, you know, I just kind of feel sorry for those people because obviously they they do things for money or else they wouldn't have even brought it up. Well, yeah, it's you know absolutely <laughs> their projection. Right? Yeah, they're, they're projecting their moral code onto me. Sure. Uh, and, you know, if they ever see where I live, I just live in a very modest two-bedroom apartment, looks like a housing commission apartment. Mm. I ride a motorbike. I don't have a car. And I, I just don't... I, money doesn't drive me at all. Yeah, sure. And uh, and if they saw that, they'd go, oh, gee, maybe we've judged him incorrectly. Mm. But no, they, you know, they don't do that. They just shoot from the hip and go, we need to destroy that guy because he's making us look bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, look, uh, when you said uh, patient autonomy, that's that's really important, right? Like, I mean, as I said earlier, you, you, um, you treated one of my uh, friends, um, and it was it was just watching, a, you know, two parents, absolutely helplessness. You know, they were just like, we can't do anything. We've tried everything and no one would um, operate on him. Right. And so, um, and you came along and said, look, we can, but the chances are all we're doing is just prolonging his life. And you were the only one that offered any kind of hope. Right. So in that essence, they did get, end up getting, you know, those um, extra months and extra uh, extra year to spend with uh, Andrea. 
And that was more than money could buy. Yeah. So when you, um, you know, when you deal with, uh, if there's a, there's a quote that I want to read, um, not a quote, a, a letter that um, I found uh, from one of your speeches um, from a patient, and right. it was from uh, Keena's mother. He said, I hope with all my might that you will not let us, let us down. You are our only hope, and despite all the risks, you have my trust. At this stage, my only wish is to spend one last Christmas with Keena. I mean, I watched um, that uh, speech you gave at TEDx with uh, my partner, and because we have a young daughter of our own, we both really um, were quite emotional. And we we all uh, we, we looked at each other and said, how can... Um, how can that not be the right thing to do? Yes. Well, again, yeah. I wish you could. <laughs> I wish you could say that to my colleagues because they're currently trying to stop me from doing that exact thing. So there are two cases that I'm being uh, hauled over the coals for at the moment. Both of them were where I thought I was hoping to give two beautiful ladies just an extra bit of life or some quality of life before they died. Both of them, you know, terrible cases, cancer. Uh, and both of them unsuccessful. So, uh, and again, normally the uh, families would say to me, look, we didn't want to go down without a fight. You respected our wishes. We knew the risks involved. Thank you very much. Mm. But unfortunately, uh, in one of these cases at least, uh, the doctors in Western Australia got hold of the uh, case uh, for other reasons uh, and they've used that against against me, that I should never have operated, the whole thing was futile, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the other case, unfortunately, a uh, disgruntled family member got involved in that one and uh, basically has influenced the family to be angry about the operation rather than being thankful for the operation. Uh, I just wish they could understand, I wish both the ladies were still alive because they were beautiful people mm. and they didn't want to go down without a fight and they knew exactly the consequences of a good or a bad operation Yeah, and they would be turning in their graves if they knew what was happening because if these two cases against me are successful, then you know I won't be able to practice anymore. And if I can't practice anymore, the number of people who are going to die uh, who... I know I could save and at least buy time for mm. is, you know, the number is just, uh, you know, uh, you just cannot fathom the sort of uh, consequences it will have. I mean, every day I get sent cases from around the world of people with tumours that other people won't operate on mm. and uh, and for good reasons too. I'm, again, I'm not being critical of them but cases that I know that I could actually t t take these tumours out and buy some good time, if not cure. Mm. Uh, but uh, it must take an emotional toll on you too, with every unsuccessful um, operation. You know, because you you do seem like the type of person who do take it personally when someone passes. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. It takes a huge emotional toll, mm. and I think that's the justification for doctors not behaving like me. And that is, you know, wearing the white coat or the suits, sitting behind the desk not looking at the patients, yeah. not calling them by their first name, not having them call them by their first name. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. Well, it is and isn't. It's ridiculous because it's not the way I would like to be treated if I was a patient. Mm. It, uh, the rationale for their behaviour, and I was told this uh, when I didn't pass my exam, the, my examiner sat me down and said, Charlie, you've just got to stop being the sort of person you are. You'll never survive like that. And, and again, he was trying to be helpful. He goes, you know, if you keep... He said, you've got to stop getting people to call you by your first name and developing a relationship with your patients because if you keep doing that, it's going to take it such a toll on you that you won't be able to keep it up for very long. Whereas if you separate yourself from your patients and maintain it some sort of distance, then it's going to keep your professional career going longer. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, there is some cred in that and there is some truth in that. Uh, again, it's not the way I want to practice and I, I would never consider doing any, uh, treating my patients in any other way except the way I treat them now. But uh, but I do understand why people do it. Mm. 
It's it's funny because you never hear them pra- sing your praises when you do have a op- uh, successful operation. No, <laughs> no never. <laughs> you know? Oh, it's crazy. It's and like, the- well, what what happened to the, the, the ones that no one wanted to, the, the you know, the... Um, yeah. Uh, the cases that no one wanted to touch. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. They, uh, I remember you um, uh, saying that you treated a, you know, a patient that uh, no one wanted to touch and everyone misdiagnosed and he ended up being a malignant tumor that you took out and they were healthy afterwards. So that person would have essentially died. Yeah, yeah, and I've published. I've published those. I've published all these cases of so-called inoperable tumors who that ended up being, you know, either... Uh, curable or certainly uh, treatable and and buying people time. And so one of the criticisms of my colleagues is that, you know, oh, he says he does this and does that, and everyone knows I do or else I wouldn't have survived 30 years doing what I do. And, you know, there's thousands of patients out there with great results, but they still say, oh, no, he needs to publish. Well, you know, the ridiculous thing is I've published uh, the second most publications out of any neurosurgeon Mm. in Australia uh, and so they're all there showing all the good results, but they just refuse to either read them or believe them. Yeah. But, uh, but no, it's all published. It's all out there showing that these techniques are actually worthwhile techniques. And, you know, if, again, if they, if they weren't worthwhile techniques, why would I get all the neurosurgeons from all the major universities in America wanting to come and learn my techniques? Mm, sure. I mean, Johns Hopkins sent out their neurosurgeons to learn my technique. I've got the neurosurgeon from Yale at the moment, Harvard, Stanford... B&I, uh, Albert Einstein, you know, I've got all these neurosurgeons from all the best places in the world wanting to come and learn my technique. If it wasn't good, do you think they'd be sending them out here to mm. learn from me? Yeah, absolutely. There's a real disconnect there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can be so critical for so long, but surely the public are going to see that, hang on, if he's so bad as a doctor, if he's such a bad person, why is it that, you know, all, we hear all these stories in the media of him saving people and why is it that he's lauded and and respected all around the world except for Australia? It, it just, it, it's crazy. We, ha- we have a, I'm not sure if you know this, but we have a thing called the tall poppy syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, look I, look, I knew about the tall poppy syndrome, so it's not as if I was naive. Yeah, of course. But I thought that the tall poppy syndrome would not get in the way of patient care. Yeah. I really did. I thought that that Hippocratic Oath, uh, the ethics of doctors would be such that, sure, I might, they might have bruised egos and they might not like me as a person, but they would never let a patient suffer through uh, ego or through political uh, persuasion. Uh, and that's the thing that's most abhorrent and that's the thing that's mm. most, you know, despicable about what's happened, that, you know, people do let politics get in the way of patient care. Yeah. How many patients do you think you would have treated um, and have lived a uh, reasonable, um, you know, life or length of time or even cured um, as a result of every other uh, neurosurgeon or um uh, hospital rejecting them and not wanting to give them a chance. No, it's thousands. It's thousands. So Remember, I don't get referrals from doctors. Sure. I don't get referrals from emergency rooms or neurologists. I get them from purely word of mouth. So right. easily 95% of my patients have come to me because they've heard about me mm. or they've been rejected by someone else. So it's by far the majority of my patients that have been told it's inoperable. Mm. So those people would have died regardless. Yes. And not only just died, but they would have died usually within days or weeks or months of seeing me. Uh, So, yeah, they know that they're at the end of their journey. They know that this is their last chance to salvage a bit of life or maybe a cure. Mm. And uh, they're willing to take the the high-risk nature of what what I offer. Yeah, that must be super frustrating not having someone in not having a lot of people in your fraternity to back you on uh, on this? There's no one. Yeah. You're on your own, totally on your own. And, you know, I've had some good friends call me up over the years saying, Charlie, you know, congratulations on what you're doing, but, you know, do you realise that if ever, anyone ever wants to sue you or if anyone wants to challenge you, you're not going to get support from anyone in Australia? And uh, they told me that to be kind to me and to try and sort of... I guess, get me to temper my 
my personality, but uh, uh, but they're absolutely right. Yeah, that's what's happened now. It's you know you, you're totally on your own when you're a uh, when you're a so-called maverick or when you're swimming mm. against the tide. You've got to understand that. Uh, and and again, I guess some in some way philosophically, I have understood that that I I, I have understood that eventually it's not going to be a happy ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on the um, you know. I wouldn't predict the future because, you know. Yeah, but, well, it's not going to be a happy ending, not, not so much because they might win but because emotionally it will just take its toll. It, it was just neurosurgery. I could keep doing this for years. Sure. I love it. I'm good at it. I'm trained at it. I, I've got 11,000 cases under my belt. You know, uh, I've got a great support team around me in terms of my nurses and my staff uh, and my family. Uh, but no, it's the politics. The politics takes its toll. Yeah. So, um, you know, why why do you keep on putting yourself out there uh, in the media or in the public eye, as per se? Uh, I guess initially it was because every time I made some appearance on the media, people would hear about me, and then I'd get referrals, and then I'd be able to save lives. Yeah. So I used to justify it by saying, "Look, I don't, I don't uh, seduce the media, but yes, you're absolutely right. I could always reject the media, and I didn't. Mm. So I've got to take responsibility for the fact that I have a media profile. Uh, so tell me the reasons why you have it. And again, I used to be able to say, "Well, it's because I get I get patients, and it raises awareness." And then there came a time where I was trying to raise money for brain cancer research. Yes. And so, again, the more media exposure I got, the more uh, donations we'd get to the foundation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there came a time where, uh, I don't know, I just uh, I wanted the public to know that uh, I appreciated them mm. and I appreciate their support. Sure. Uh, but... I guess in some ways I wanted to make sure they understood the journey I was going through as well. Yep. And now, why did I dis- why did I uh, agree to do this interview with you? Uh, I think it's for different reasons now. I think it's because uh, I'd like to leave a legacy. Yeah. And if the legacy can't be the lives that I've saved or the changes I've made in neurosurgery, at least let it be that, you know, people like me out there who are doing it hard... Uh, uh, my strong recommendation is that uh, as long as it's for the greater good, then at least you're going to be able to be comfortable with yourself and at least you can be proud of yourself and your children will be proud of you. Absolutely. Uh, and what, what is the greater good? I mean, the greater good is basically where uh, more than you, uh, the, the, the most people are going to benefit from what you've done. It's not just you or your family or your neighbour, but it's the majority of people are going to benefit from what you've done. So I'd like people to know that, you know, take the high road, think about the greater good, try not to think about your own survival. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and in the long run, uh, you can be very comfortable and very happy with your life. Absolutely. Uh, that you've made something of it. Well, that's, that's extremely inspiring and also a huge amount of tenacity from from your side. Oh my God! You need so much tenacity. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You need to. Uh, oh, it was like uh, I went through a midlife crisis where I decided to be a mountain climber, and uh, yeah, I. I Are those people did, nuts? Uh, oh, it's crazy! It's crazy. <laughs> I went and did uh, Chimborazo and Cotopaxi, wow. in uh, Ecuador, and uh, look, I don't know if you've ever done, ever done mountain climbing, but there comes a time where you are just totally spent. Yeah. You've got no oxygen, no energy, you're tired, you, you, you've got diarrhoea because you're in a different country, you're cold, yeah, your hands yeah. are frozen and it's like, oh, my God, how do you keep going? And it's that whole, that old story, just take one step, step at, at a time. time. yeah. And one step takes you about five to ten seconds because you've got, you're puffing and panting but then you've got to take another step and, you know, just one step at a time and you eventually get to the top of the yeah. mountain. And yeah, yeah. that's what it's been like. It's, it's been like that. It's been, you know, constant battles, constant hurdles to jump over, uh, constant acrimony and criticism and vilification and vexatious complaints by, uh, by 
basically the medical fraternity. Uh, but, you know, one step at a time, one step at a time, and, uh, and eventually you'll make it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, t- speaking of tenacity, the, the, there was a great story that you told uh, with a patient of yours that um, that you operated on that lost a lot of blood in, you know, 40 minutes. And after six hours, you still haven't even touched the, <laughs> the tumor. <laughs> yeah. And all your supporting staff, including your anesthetist, basically said, you know, it's time Charlie, to give up. <laughs> time to give up. Yeah. What did you say to them? Uh, Get started. Yeah, so that case is <laughs> I gave another TED talk talking about tenacity. And uh, yeah, that uh, I, I actually have a PowerPoint presentation called My, My Most Difficult Case. And uh, so I'll never forget it, of course. It's by far the most difficult case I've ever done. A young girl, university student, dying on the table, three or four cardiac arrests, uh, you know, runners running back and forth to the blood bank, 30 people in the room, uh, you know, pumping a chest. uh, (laughs) And then the tumour was still in. It couldn't get it out. And everyone looking at me going, Charlie, just give up, just give up. And uh, you know what I did? I just thought to myself, what is that if that was my daughter mm. on the table? And that's what I do with all my patients. I think, you know, what if that was my wife? Or well, that was, what if that was my mother or my daughter or my son or my father? Uh, how would I want the surgeon to treat that person? Uh, and that's what I did with her. I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to give up. I'm not, it was 3 o'clock in the morning. I've been operating since 9 uh, at night. Mm. Because it was an emergency, uh, blood was just going everywhere. Everyone was tired. I'd called in two other neurosurgeons to help me, and uh, yeah, no, I just kept going and going. And eventually, uh, yeah, eventually she she actually left the hospital about five days after surgery. Wow, it was crazy. Wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. she didn't realize. I don't think she ever realized how uh, close to death she was. Is she? Um, is she still alive yeah, today? Yeah, still alive wow. and. Uh, Paralyzed, but she was paralyzed oh, before she had the surgery. Sure, and uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, you know, stories like that really, um, really do give you a sense of hope uh, when you do, you know, come into those hard times. You, you know, you start questioning yourself and your own um, um, reasons on why you're doing that, right? Yes. So when you have a case like that, you know, it must feel good for you to say, "Well, I've done this before." Yeah. Look, the time you really question yourself is when you get bad outcomes, of course. That's yeah. when you really go, shit, did I, did I make those decisions for the right reasons? Was I trying to prove something? Was I, mm. you know, did I do that because I was in a hurry? Did I, did I operate because I need the money or, you know, you, and, and uh, if you ever did it for the wrong reasons, that's when I don't think you can survive neurosurgery you mm. just because you'd be... You'd be just killing yourself, I reckon. Yeah. So that's why you've got to, right from the get-go, you've got to say, okay, bad outcome, but I did it for the right reasons. I did it because I really, truly, honestly thought it was going to help that person. Yeah. And uh, it was going to be respectful to that person's wishes. And then you can survive it. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure that girl, you know, is really grateful that you didn't give up. Who knows? She. <laughs> Yeah. She sent me a, I think she sent me a Christmas card about a year later, but no, I haven't heard from her since. And I don't, th- yeah, look, I don't think she'll ever quite understand how difficult that one was. Mm. And you know, the only feedback I got, oh, this is really sad. So, you know, you would think that if the authorities heard what I'd done, they would have gone, oh my God, congratulations. That shows amazing tenacity and skill and perseverance. And sure. And teamwork and congratulations. Now I got a letter of complaint uh, from the blood bank saying that we understand that you use 30 units or 96 units of blood, 30 units of this and that. The other night on a patient, please explain uh, why the case was done at 9 o'clock at night and, uh, you know, basically give me a wrap over my knuckles for using up uh, so much blood products. They, of course, had no idea that the girl had deteriorated during the Mm. night and that's why we had to... Anyway, I, I think I ignored the letter. I, I think I, oh, you know, it's just like... You Can't got, believe you. <laughs> you've got to be kidding. Do you question, <laughs> like, why you even... Um, uh, okay, you don't question yourself at that moment, but you do you sometimes think, 
these people are just unbelievable. Why why do I keep on putting myself through that? Yes, I do. I think of that all the time. I think, God, why am I doing this? Because, you know, it drags other people into it as well. My poor wife, yeah. ex-wife, she had to go through it for years, the ups and downs and all the rhetoric and all the, you know, all the destructive and malicious comments in the media and stuff. And, sure. And uh, my children have had to bear the brunt of it and Absolutely. my office and my loved ones. And and so you do th- sometimes think, you know, God, it's all right for me but do I have to drag everyone else through this as well? Mm. And, you know, why don't I just toe the party line? Why don't I stop giving contrary second opinions? Why don't I stop just telling these – why don't I just say to these people, yes, your doctor's right, it's inoperable? Because and, it's uh, not the right thing to do, right? Well, again, you know, if I'd, if I'd done – what that chairman said to do, if I'd come back to Australia and I towed the party line and I started just becoming a popular neurosurgeon, maybe I would have got referrals from my colleagues and maybe, I don't know, maybe I could have saved more lives at the end of the day than I, than I have. Mm. I mean, I'll never know that but, but uh, you know, you do think about the path you take. I once had a friend say to me, Charlie, you know, your aim is to get to the top of the hill, isn't it, top of the mountain? I go, yeah. He goes, well, look, there are two paths. You can take the path where it's never been trod before. You need a machete to cut through all the vines. You Sure, you get to the top but you're bleeding, you're cut, your shirt's torn, you're sweating, it's been a terrible hard road. Or you can take the road that's already beaten, beaten, you know, the, but the path that's, you know, uh, it's already been made. You get you, everyone gets to the top, but at least you get there without, uh, with a little bit of uh, self-preservation. If you take the other yeah, road, sure. and I, I always remember that analogy. Think to myself, well, why didn't I take that road? God, it would have made my life so much easier. And uh, I don't know, but then, then you just got to think of all those patients that you've saved. And if yeah. uh, if you if you had taken that road and said that the tumour was inoperable, then that person would be dead. And I mean, there's a perfect example. I can I can mention her name because mm. she wouldn't mind. Katie, her name is, and her mum Megan had the uh, courage to come to me and say, "Please, can you operate?" When a very good neurosurgeon had tried to take it out and told her it was inoperable, and you know she was going to die because it was in a brainstem. Anyway, I took it out now. She's the mother of three and she's got this beautiful life and and she's contributing to society and everyone's very happy. And, you know, even if that was the only patient I had ever saved, then I think it's probably worth it. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. that has to tell you you're doing the right thing there because that person would no longer be on this planet. No, no. and her yeah. children would be on this planet. Yeah. You know, and and those countless amount of patients that you've given the extra time to to the family and loved ones to make, you know, just that one extra memory, mm. you know. Yeah. So, no, I think I think absolutely you're doing you know you're doing the right thing, and I think um, you would absolutely inspire a lot of people to keep on going. Yeah. Um, and you obviously start in 2018. You obviously started your new uh, foundation. Yes, yes. I'm very um, happy about that. But again, under a controversial sort of yeah, cloud. Yeah, oh, under controversial <laughs> cloud. Um, uh, but, you know... Um, and again, I didn't try and yeah. be controversial about that. I, sure. I mean, I was just honest. Mm. I was just honest. I mean, the, the people in my last foundation are good people. You know, they're not dishonest people, but yeah. I just didn't like the way it was being done. I just didn't like the amount of money it was costing to run the charity. Yeah. You said sixty something. Sixty-eight percent. Sixty-eight percent were the overheads, uh, and higher now. Uh, and I just don't think that's right. Mm. And apparently, it's common in very large charities. Very but no, common. But no one stands up to them, and no one sort of whistle is a whistleblower. Uh, everyone sort of accepts it as you know the norm. But I don't think we should as a, as a society. I don't think. If you donate a dollar to a charity, you would hope that at least 80 cents of that dollar goes to the Never actual the cause. Case. Yeah. And that's not the case. No. It's not the case. So it's it's funny because uh, charities as a whole, people who uh, are attracted to working for charities are people who want to do good in the world. Yes. I, I generally believe that. Yes, I but, do too. But unfortunately, um, many of them don't have the business acumen to run it lean and to actually make a difference. Yes. So what ends up happening is 
a lot of these charities get sucked up um, with uh, its resources by doing things or adding new people because they might need. So it becomes a whole clusterfuck yeah. of uh, incompetence in management. Yeah, yeah, poor management. Poor management. Yeah. And I think um, someone like Bill Gates with, uh, you know, his um, Bill Gates Foundation yes. is driven and run by him. Right. <laughs> which makes a huge difference in, you know, treating malaria and, you know, uh, grant, giving grants to certain research institutions. I think that makes a much bigger difference if yeah. it's run, you know, more or less as an organisation in that, in that yeah. way, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I pledge I pledge to the public that I would run lean. We'd uh, utilise volunteerism. We would uh, be transparent so that uh, our followers would know exactly and we wouldn't spin it because, mm-hmm. you know, that's the trouble. A lot of the large charities spin it so that you can't tell how much money is going to yep. admin and how much is going to the cause. For example, some charities call salaries, uh, they don't put it under administration costs, they put it under raising awareness. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that bad? So, you know, a charity can go, our administration costs are only 10%. Well, uh, hang on, what about the $3.3 million in charity, in salaries? Oh, no, that's those, because, that's, uh, those people are raising awareness. I mean, you know, mm. come on. Come on, be honest. Yeah. Be, be honest and be transparent. No, I, I think it's a really good thing that you're doing and hopefully one day we have a breakthrough in, you know, um, in, in treatment of brain cancers and well, tumours. We will. I mean, as long as, as long as you get the money, you get the answers. Mm. I mean, really, the template's been written. Look at leukaemia. Yeah. As a medical student, I was told that 95% of people with leukaemia would die. Yeah. Now... It's 95% of people survive. Survive, yeah. And how's that happen? It's all research. Absolutely. How's the research happen? It's all money. Yeah. <laughs> so I hate to say it, but uh, yeah. money does drive a research. Mm-hmm. And uh, so if you donate enough money, then you will get uh, answers. And that's what we're hoping, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, of course, um, you know, later on in 2018, things started to not go um shall we say, the way that uh, in your life, not the way that you <laughs> right. wanted. Um, you mentioned that you split up with your wife. Um, yeah. That was in late 2018. Yeah, 2018. early. Early, uh, 2018. early or, yeah, center, yeah, sometime. That must have been... Um, but, that must have been tough as well for someone oh, who was... It was, uh, very, it was very tough, very sad because, you know, that was always my rock, yeah. my family. And, you know, with all the politics of work and people trying to destroy me at work, at least I could go home and go, well... Fuck them. At least I've got a beautiful family who support me. And so when my family broke up, mostly because of me, mm. uh, you know, it's you lose that rock and you lose that sort of foundation and the anchor. Uh, oh, I've since, I'm hoping I've got it back now. I've got a lovely partner now and I've got four beautiful girls who support me. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I'm hoping I'll get that back again. But you're right, it does rock your boat and it really does sit you on an uneven sort of keel. Did you feel alone? Oh, when oh my God, happened? yes. Yeah. Oh, totally alone. Yeah, Genevieve was my uh, 100% ally. You know, I can never be critical of her for that. She was an ally through and through. She mm. was always there to support me. Uh, yeah, and I lost that. Yeah. Yeah. That must have been real, t- uh, really, really tough for you to, um, you know, um, continue with uh, battling the, uh, the, you know, the medical fraternity and the people that are against you. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And then, and of course, in 2019, things really took a turn oh, for you. Oh, my God. Don't even um, talk about that. It was just terrible. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to bring some stuff up and I, I want I want you to share some of the, um, you know, uh, you know, that's, Tough moments and how you right. how you deal how you with deal them. with it, yeah. You know, obviously in um, sort of early 2019, um, uh, a medical um, um, professional, not not in the neurosurgery uh, space, um, but a gentleman named Henry Wu came out and spoke, um, you know, uh, critically of your fees and for your operations, and he said that the number of crowdfunding. Um, campaigns were really disturbing. Yes. And, of course, people in the industry all came up and said, yes, that's a person not in my field and he's, uh, that's exactly what we've all been, uh, you know, thinking. So how did that, you know, that, that just seems like, 
they all came out of the woodworks and jumped <laughs> on you. Yeah, I even went to Google to find out why, what, what that phenomenon is all about. And it's that herd phenomenon. It's, yeah. uh, it's the uh, pack mentality. So that when uh, prey is down and blood is drawn, the pack surrounds and just goes for it. Mm. And I think because Henry Wu had uh, cred, I mean, he's a counsellor mm. for the College of Surgeons. Sure. And he's a non neurosurgeon, so no one could blame him. No one could say he was jealous of me. Or a rival. Or a rival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think everyone then goes, yes, now let's go in for the kill. <laughs> And uh, so, what did they, again, it wasn't anger so much, but total shock at the way these people were willing to come out and sort of support him mm. against me. Even the Cancer Council of New South Wales, a, a, yeah. a group that I had supported, and I'd raised millions of dollars for cancer research, and I'd raised millions of dollars for them, uh, they came out against me. The AMA came out against mm. me. My colleagues, the NSA, the College of Surgeons, the H. APRA, they, they all came out and uh, said, yeah, yeah, Henry Wu's right, let's, let's crucify that guy. And uh, it was really uh, it was a real shock. It's, it's, what I don't understand is it's such bullshit because in every other fucking industry, if you are worth, uh, if you are talented and you're skilled and you get to the top of your industry, charging uh, money is... A matter of that's just the way it is because they're the best. Yeah. But for some reason, they uh, everyone wants you to do this for free. Yeah. And and like you know, uh, I'm I'm not saying that. Um, uh, I I don't know how much you earn, but I would say uh, you earn reasonable living. Yes. But there are far more people uh, that earn more than you just being small business owners, being um, you know. <laughs> People who've sold a business, yeah, and they, you know, they don't get crucified. Yes. Do you expect them to do it for fucking free? Know, do you expect crazy. Roger Federer to play for free? Yeah. Like, I don't understand this mentality. Like, why? Why is it all of a sudden that you have to then dis disclose and then uh, and charge no money for it? Yeah, I know, I know. Why don't the other surgeons go and operate on these fuckers? Yeah, you know, <laughs> like, oh uh, god. I know it's it's a really weird sort of. Uh, Sorry, I shouldn't say fuckers. Why don't these other people go treat the patients, right? Yeah, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, look, someone said to me, "You should charge what you think you're worth." And so, at the end of the day, I think I'm worth a lot because uh, you know I've been at it for thirty years. I'm considered one of the best in the world. They come from all around the world for me to operate on them. Mm. I'm seduced to work in America, Germany, Singapore because I'm. That good. Uh, I've I've dedicated my life to learning and teaching. Uh, it consumes me. I spend every minute of the day thinking about my patients. So surely I deserve a reasonable uh, reimbursement for that. Absolutely. But uh, then again, I must say that I am kind of uh, also uh, sympathetic to those who believe that medicine should be free. Uh, that it's not uh, uh, a luxury, it's a right. Uh, and in the ideal world, I absolutely would operate in a free setting uh, and give my talents to poor people as well if I could. And that is that is the worst thing about this whole campaign against me mm. and that is that it's always about he should do it in the public hospital. He should do it free in the public hospital. It should be done at Sydney Children's Hospital where he has operating rights. I do not have a public hospital appointment, period. Mm -hmm. I do not have operating rights at Sydney Children's Hospital. And so all the rhetoric, is all, it was all false. So, you know, that whole thing about Henry Wu saying it should be done in the public system because he's got privileges in the public system, I do not have privileges. And not only don't I have privileges but for the last... 30 years I've been telling my public patients from interstate, I will do your operation for free if you can get a neurosurgeon to invite me to your state to do it. Mm. And, and you ask my staff, you ask my patients, you ask all my fellows who sit in on every consultation and they will tell you that I make that offer to any public patient from any state uh, that I will 
If you pay for my airfare and my accommodation, I will fly to your state, I will do your operation free of charge. Mm. And have I ever been invited? Never. There's See, only been one neurosurgeon who's invited me from West Wesleyan Children's Hospital to do it free there. And he's a very nice man. Uh, in fact, I'd love to give him a plug. His name is Mark Dexter. And Mark Dexter had the courage and the goodwill to say, Charlie, I'm going to drop all the politics. You're good at this particular case. I want you to come to Westmead. I'm going to invite you. I'm going to take responsibility for it. I'll look after the patients when you leave because I want the best thing for this patient. And what did I do? I went out there. I paid my own way out there to Westmead. I paid for my own parking. I didn't get paid a cent and I operated free of charge on that patient with a good outcome. Mm. And that's the way it, I've wanted it to be since my return from America to Australia and Mark Dexter's the only neurosurgeon ever to invite me uh, to operate in a public system. God, that must be so frustrating that no one talks about this. No one talks about that. No one talks about that. Mm. Well, hopefully some viewers and listeners can actually hear this. Yeah, yeah, but again, you know, every doctor hates me mm. and so, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. Someone invited me the other day to I paddle, I kayak, and she goes, oh, I've got a group of friends who do go kayaking every morning. Uh, maybe you want to kayak with them. And I go, oh, I'd love to. So she goes to them, oh, my friend Charlie Teo, he's a kayaker, he'd love to kayak with you. Charlie Teo, and there were three doctors in the group, no way, you know, he's this, he's that, he's a money-hungry man. And they'd never and met me. And they're not? No. <laughs> I didn't say that. You said that. <laughs> but they have never met me. And so they judge, everyone judges me based on what they hear, you know, secondhand or thirdhand. And yeah. Actually, some people even judge me after they meet me. So maybe I'm not such a nice person after all. But, yeah, I've even had people who have met me go, oh, yeah, right. Mm. And uh, But it's always doctors. It's just doctors. Yeah. yeah. So that's... Um, yeah, I mean, that, that must be super frustrating to some degree. Yeah. And yeah, that whole media thing and that Henry Wu thing, oh, my God, Henry, just, so, you know, I mm. don't even know Henry. I, you know, sure, sure. He's probably a lovely guy but he's just got this bee in his bonnet and he's listened, you know, I think he's listened to everyone else because he doesn't know me. Mm -mm -mm. So he must have heard other people talking about me yeah, or something. I mean, and it's by osmosis, right? Yeah, and even Kate McClymont, who wrote all those terrible articles in the Sydney Morning Herald. I don't blame her either because someone's – she said she interviewed 14 neurosurgeons and all 14 neurosurgeons would have said terrible things about me. So all she did, I guess, was report what she'd heard about me. Yeah. I mean, you just bring that up. Um, later on that year, she, re you know, um, released that article in the Sydney Morning Herald, um, you know, that uh, she – you did, you know, you were uh, behaved in certain ways that it was inappropriate. Yeah, and then she obviously brought up uh, the Henry Wu thing again, and also, you know, mentioned you with um, your previous charity with Mick Gatto. Um, oh my God, you know, she was, went for she, she went for the she jungle. went to town. <laughs> she went to town, <laughs> and not once did I read that in an article. You happened to save lives. Yes, or that you had a charity foundation that were contributing to, you know, brain research, cancer research and brain, yeah, yeah. Brain, brain cancer research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she really uh, went to town. I mean, God, those, those things must have, um, you know. Uh, well, I think, again, it's shock. Yeah. Uh, rather than anger, it was, it was like, hang on, like she accused me or she was, hang on. So someone accused me of using my power to gain sexual favours from a female... Resident. Mm. Okay. So this is the only thing that really irks me. I've never had a female resident. Right. I, I, no resident in neurosurgery has been allowed to rotate through my service. So it only would have taken one question or one phone call and they could have proven that that was absolute false, absolutely false. So, sure, if I'd had some female resonance and I'd try and, you know, and I'd told dirty jokes to them or something, I... I think I could have understand how it could have been twisted, mm -hmm. but I've never had a female resident. Mm. I've had three female fellows from overseas who've got nothing to do with Australia or the public system and, you know, they could have easily asked those three doctors if I'd ever been inappropriate and... Uh, but no, no. So that's the thing that really shocked me, that sure. someone can publish a, a pure lie mm. and get away with it, Yeah. Well, now you're going to get skewed for not having female residents. <laughs> no, I'd love them. I'd love them. 
You know, the, I would love to teach Australian no. neurosurgeons my technique. Yeah, no, I, male I, or female. I absolutely understand, but uh, you know the way that um, the media is at the moment. You know. Uh, no, no, but what I mean by that? No, I've never even had a male resident. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. I've never had a female or male resident rotate from the neurosurgical service. In my operating room, right. or in my service, they're, okay, they're right. not allowed to come over and work sure. with me. Yeah. Um, so male or female? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, the fallout of that was pretty, you know, rough because it wasn't just one thing; it was really an expose, uh, expose on yeah. all these other things. Yes. And, you know, you really basically had to, you know, pick up a baseball bat and swat away at all those, um, all those allegations and all those um, things that were said about you. I mean. It sounded like you didn't even really have time to, you know, process all that and then... Yeah, look, I didn't quite understand or appreciate the enormity of those negative articles. What's since happened is the Singapore Medical Council has got wind of it and they've put my licence on hold, uh, which means, you know, I know of several children who have died uh, because I haven't been able to go to Singapore to operate on them. Mm. Uh, America... Uh, got hold of it as well, and I know that my license has been put on hold over there as well. Uh, so that means, you know, look, I, look, I don't know how to philosophically get around it or try and feel comfortable with it, but as long as those people know that their actions have resulted in the death of many, many children because of uh, because of the fallout of those negative articles. Mm. If that's their intention, well, congratulations. If you wanted kids to die, then that's what's happened. Uh, now, look, I know, and again, philosophically, I know that there are people out there who never come to see me, I can't operate on them, so the people are going to die anyway. Sure. Uh, so you can't save everyone, if you, if you know what I mean. And uh, so, you know, I can't save everyone and now I can't save people that I know I could have saved if, I had, uh, if those negative articles hadn't come out. Mm. But those people have to please at least accept that what you've done has resulted in the death of many children. Yeah. That's, you know, that's extremely sad. It is very sad. It's really sad. It is very sad. But, you know, maybe that was their intention. So if that's their intentions and they get paid a good salary for it, then so be it. You know, there mm. are, you know that great philosopher, what's her name? Uh, Taylor Swift. She goes, uh, <laughs> you know, haters are going to hate. Yeah. Haters are going to hate. Yeah, they're always going to hate. You know, that's there's true. always going to be haters mm. and they're always going to hate. What's your coping mechanism for stuff like this? Like, I mean, when you when you go through a bad operation or when you go through a, another group of uh, medical professionals having a go at you or the media having a go at you or your daughter experiencing this or your, you know, like, what's what's your uh, what's your vice? You know, like you you mentioned kayaking and obviously motorbiking. It is, and I think the thing that really keeps me going is my patience, Sure, believe it or not, because at the end of the day, I don't have brain cancer. <laughs> I, I, it almost sounds trite, but it isn't mm. because, and I know, I know it sounds awfully cliche, but when you've got your health uh, and even when you don't have your health, you've always got to try and remember there's someone worse off than you. Yeah. And so, yes, no, it's been really hard. The last 12 months has been, oh, my God, most people would have, I think, jumped off the gap or most people would have been <laughs> depressed or, you know. But, you know, I'm still a happy person. I mean, I wake up every day and once I get over all the turmoil I'm thinking about, once I actually get into the swing of the day, I'm, I start to appreciate that my life isn't as bad as it was when I was lying in bed thinking about it this morning mm. because, you know, I've just talked to a mother who's eight-year-old child is dying of brain cancer so how dare I even think that my life is bad uh, and even if I had brain cancer you know there's other people who would be worse off than me mm. so I don't know it's just uh, yeah you've got you've got to almost consciously be uh, be reminding yourself of that it's not a subconscious thing it's you know I actually physically find myself telling myself, mm. Charlie, you don't have brain cancer. Yeah. You know, please try not to you know, worry about, you know, the mounting legal costs and the and the fights that you're having to fight and the HCCC and APRA and College of Surgeons and this and that after you. Don't, 
you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's 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 all part of life. Mm. I guess in your line of work, you really do have a check on your perspective when you look at a patient yes. and then you look at your own life, even though it might be in turmoil, there's someone who's about yeah. to lose their life. Yeah. yeah. There, are, I've always said there are two, two well, there's one good thing and one bad thing about dealing with death and dying every day. The good thing is that it puts things in perspective and the bad thing is that it puts things out of perspective. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I, I don't think Genevieve would mind me saying this, but I'd, I'd get home at the end of the day after seeing a child dying of cancer and Genevieve would be upset about something that happened during the day with the neighbour or the girls or the dogs. Mm. And the whole bad thing about dealing with death and dying is that I would not give her the uh, valid... Uh, I would not give her the uh, the respect that she deserved uh, that those issues were uh, an issue for her. Yeah, yeah. So I would almost belittle her and I would almost belittle the whole situation by saying, are you kidding? You know, that's nothing compared to what I've had to put up with today yeah. or what, you know, what I saw today. Uh, but it is something to those people because, you know, those people aren't dealing with death and Absolutely, dying every day. Yeah. So. You know, the guy next door who's constantly abusing you or making a loud noise or not being respectful of you, of course that's going to bug you. And you'd love your partner to go, yeah, I, I feel for you and, yeah, let's do something about it. But instead what I'd do is go, oh, yeah, okay, you know, and p pay her very little uh, acknowledgement mm. of the effect it was having on her. So that's the bad side of dealing with death and dying. It... it <laughs> It puts things in such perspective that you don't understand other people's lack of perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That must. Uh, I mean, that's that's the basis of all relationship arguments, right? You know, you don't see things from her perspective, yes. and she doesn't things uh, see things from your perspective. Yeah, I yeah. guess yours is just on the extreme end of mm. that. It is extreme. Anyone who's dealing with those, you know, with oncology or cancer, uh, you know, it really, uh, yeah. oh, my God, it just, it's a real awakening. That mm. life is just so fragile that you have to uh, take every day as it comes and you have to appreciate what you've got rather than what you don't have. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, you know, sharing all that with us. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure I um, brought up some... Um, some hard, uh, hard feelings and hard times for you, but yes. uh, I, I'm really um, grateful that you shared some of this because I think it absolutely would benefit a lot of people. Um, it certainly benefited me, and certainly, uh, you know, given me some inspiration on uh, some of the things that I do. And I think it's hard, or, um, but yeah, you know, I think what you're doing is a, a really great thing, um, especially considering I've been personally affected um, um, in that you've treated one of um, my friends and my close colleague's uh, son. Right. Um, so I think you are doing the right thing and I think there are a lot of people out there that would, um, you know, appreciate the work that you do. Oh, thank you. No, look, the Australian public have been lovely. Yeah. I mean, you know, even with those negative articles in the Sydney Morning Herald last sure. year, most people still think of those articles as bullshit yeah. and uh, and uh, see, see them for what they were. Mm. Uh, so the public have been lovely. I mean, you've been lovely. The fact that you've got me here and didn't believe those things I think is mm. telling in itself. So, uh, no, you're thanking me but I thank you very much for uh, oh. believing in me yeah, you're and not <laughs> believing the newspapers. No, absolutely, you're welcome. <laughs> I've had my personal experience with newspapers and, you know, unfortunately some people do believe those papers and... Yes. But um, I really appreciate you coming on and please tell me a little bit more about your charity before we, uh, we leave and I can then, you know, give... Yeah, look, I'm really proud of that website. and you're right. I wish the media would actually underscore that because that's something I'm really proud of. A lot of doctors do their bit, they make a living and then, you know, they don't really give back much. Mm. And so I think it's necessary to give back. I think it's good to give back and uh, the way I've tried to give back to society is by raising money for brain cancer research to support our scientists who are, you know, 
at the coalface and really working hard to try and find cures or treatments for brain cancer. So, yes, it started off as the Cure for Life Foundation, then it uh, morphed into the Cure Brain Cancer Foundation and now the Charlie Teo Foundation. And over the last 20 years, since 1999, I've raised over $35 million. Wow. Uh, for brain cancer research uh, and uh, the Charlie Teo Foundation is a foundation I'd love a lot of people to support. Why? Because even if you haven't been touched by brain cancer, if you want to support a charity that where you know exactly where your money's going, mm. that it's not being wasted uh, and uh, that we are funding uh, not standard old scientists, we are trying to find... Uh, the disruptive thinkers, the people who think outside the box and who are willing to sort of uh, uh, swim against the tide, mm. uh, they're the people that we believe uh, are going to find, uh, well, may accelerate the, the, the finding of a cure or, or treatments. I liken it to Barry Marshall. Barry Marshall was that beautiful man uh, who was a scientist or is a scientist who found that uh, gastric ulcers were due to helicobacter yes. bacteria. And the poor bugger, he, yeah, he lost yeah, all yeah. his funding, he lost his university appointment and no one would believe him and he was considered too out there. So he had to use himself as a guinea pig, Yeah, gave himself the helicobacter bacteria. and He, he drank it, didn't he? Yes, yeah. yes. And then he had to treat himself to show that he was right. Uh, and so, you know, when you meet him, you're just an, a totally uh, taken by him. He's just uh, a good person who's altruistic and therefore the betterment of mankind. Fantastic. And uh, But no one believed him. Mm. No one believed him or believed in him. And so I want to try and find the Barry Marshall brain cancer research that goes out there with a great idea, who's willing to put his own life on the line, who's passionate about it, uh, who has some scientific cred behind him, uh, but unfortunately who uh, isn't part of the mainstream. Mm. And I want to fund that person. Yeah. So that's what we're doing at Great. the Charlie Teo Foundation and we're being very, very transparent about the, where the money's going. Fantastic. That's a really beautiful cause. And you can um, find, sorry, you can visit the uh, Charlie Teo Foundation uh, website at charlieteofoundation.org.au. That's right. Please make a donation if you, um, you know, believe in the cause or if you've ever been... Uh, affected by someone that you loved uh, that's had a brain cancer or any form of cancer. You know how, um, you know, nasty it is and how quickly things de uh, deteriorate. So please support um, Charlie in his new ventures. Thank that you. would be really appreciated. <laughs> and, um, and lastly, I went to the Golden Century and asked for a Charlie role and I had no idea what I was talking about. So, you know, I must come with you one day to get that role. You have to come with me. <laughs> yeah, the Charlie Teo role was made up by the Golden Century, but I think the, it's mostly at the Century now, at the right. Star. Uh, just around the corner from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you go there and ask for the Charlie Teo seafood role, I think they'll know what you're talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. They should put it on the menu. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.